It's my pleasure I'm going uh, to, to welcome uh, Mikola Madvichuk, I hope I pronounced correctly your name, uh, who is now in McGill and who will talk today about the local Torelli theorem for log symplectic manifolds. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to speak in this seminar. Uh, so this is joint work with Brent Team, also from McGill and Travis Shadler, who is in Imperial, at Imperial College in London. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to disc I'm going to talk about log symplectic manifolds and how how the formation of uh, log symplectic manifolds works. Um, let me start with the definitions. Um, so I, I fix a smooth complex manifold of even dimension, and I fix a, a divisor on X, which is a smooth divisor, generically smooth, sorry. So it's reduced, uh, it's generically smooth, but it is allowed definitely to have uh, singularities, the divisor. And let's consider two sheaves associated with the divisor. First sheaf is sheaf of uh, vector fields tangent to the divisor. And also the dual sheaf, uh, which would be a sheaf of logarithmic forms, uh, logarithmic with respect to this divisor. So uh, uh, everywhere around the smooth point of the divisor, uh, those two would be locally free sheaves they would have very explicit uh, basis as written here. But of course, when you go uh, to more and more singular points of the divisor, they don't, they no longer require to be locally free, but they are locally free everywhere away from the divisor and around the smooth point of the divisor. Let's consider, um, let's define log symplectic form the log symplectic form would be a logarithmic form, so um, section of which two of uh, T star log D. That is closed and such that the induced map from uh, T minus log D to T star log D is an isomorphism. So everywhere away from the divisor, this is just a regular symplectic form, holomorphic symplectic form. And then it has some poles over the divisor, but still this pairing is uh, isomorphism, uh, at least away from the singular locus of D. <clears throat> so we, we don't kind of, we don't specify anything in the codimension too, because we can kind of figure out what's happening there using Hartog theorem if needed. Um, and the question I wanted to discuss today is how does one deform a uh, log symplectic manifold? X D omega. So, how does one deform a uh, triple and manifold divisor plus a log, log symplectic form with respect to this divisor? Okay. And that's that the question I want to discuss. And uh, I want to emphasize that when I talk about the formation of a triple, I don't necessarily feel particularly attached to any of this. Uh, three uh, members. So if, if I need to change divisor D, I, I'm allowed to change divisor D. And even if I want, I can change the manifold X. So deforming the whole package. <clears throat> and uh, the problem with dealing such things is that uh, form omega is uh, not holomorphic. It has poles. So it kind of makes it a little bit tricky to um, measure when, when both forms have poles, it makes it a little tricky to measure um, distance between them to, to, to say that these two forms are uh, close to each other. So it's from that perspective to, to consider um, the formation theory, it's more convenient to consider uh, to have holomorphic object. And in this situation, we do have a nice holomorphic object without poles and that's uh, Poisson by vector. So if you write down the matrix for the form omega, it's going to be skew-symmetric uh, full rank generically matrix. And so when you invert it, you obtain a bivector, 
and that bivector uh, has no poles. Um, it's holomorphic. And moreover, it's tangent to the divisor. And the fact that form was symplectic, so it was closed, is reflected in this integrability condition for the Poisson bivector. So the bracket of the Poisson bivector with itself is zero, where the bracket is the Skelton bracket. So Skelton bracket uh, is, um, when, is, is like something that takes two polyvectors uh, and spits out another one. And when you see when i is equal to j is equal to one, that's nothing else uh, than Lie bracket. But then there is a way to nicely extend Lie bracket to all polyvectors so that it satisfies uh, graded Jacobi identity, graded uh, skew symmetry, graded Leibniz rule, all these nice properties, but with some extra signs. And so uh, by vector pi satisfies this condition that pi bracket with pi is equal to zero. So that's how the fact that omega was closed is remembered when we pass to the by vector picture. And the, and the, the, the divisor that had poles of the uh, form is remembered by, by the following. So the divisor is going to be precisely the set of points where this uh, skew symmetric uh, matrix for pi drops rank. So it will generically be full rank, so n, but uh, precisely along at the points of the divisor is going to be uh, dropping rank. So the rank there are going to be less than n. Hey, Nicola, um, can, I, can I ask a yeah. question? Yeah. I'm a little puzzled. Uh, the divisor is a set where pi drops rank. Um, what is the divisor? Is this is a it's, this is a this is a complex manifold. This is just a divisor in a complex manifold, right? Yeah. Sorry. I, I by divisor I just mean uh, could I mention one a sub manifold of X, but possibly singular. Right. So so it's a holomorphic divisor. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is yeah. a and by symplectic you. Sort of mean so, it's so X is smooth and then D is co dimension one, a complex co dimension one sub manifold of X, but possibly having singularities. So X is smooth, but D is allowed to have singularities. And W is not a cater form. Uh, no, it's holomorphic, it's a two zero form, a holomorphic form, holomorphic two form. It's a holomorphic two form. Okay, so you don't assume X to be Kater, in other words. Uh, not necessarily. Yeah, I'm not using that X is Kater. Okay, okay, got it. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so, in, so, but the but form Omega, it was holomorphic form that was allowed to have poles. Now I converted it to a bivector that does not have poles. And instead of deforming a uh, you know, uh, log symplectic form, I want to consider a deformation of the bivector. So that's somehow nicer to deal with because it's a holomorphic object. And uh, I'm going to consider a problem of deforming a Poisson manifold, meaning manifold X with bivector, holomorphic bivector on it. And uh, <clears throat> whenever you study, you know, any kind of deformation problem, deformation of any kind of geometric structure, first question to ask is probably uh, what are the infinitesimal deformations or first order deformations of such things. And uh, here the answer comes from uh, this Poisson cohomology complex um, uh, invented by Lishnerovich. So Poisson cohomology, uh, is constructed in the following way. You consider all polyvectors in increasing order, starting from uh, zero vectors, just functions, then going to vector fields and bivector vector fields and so on. And the uh, bracketing with bivector pi uh, gives you a differential uh, of degree plus one. And it squares to zero precisely because of this uh, integrability condition that pi brackets with itself. To give zero. 
So this is a complex, so you can take cohomology of it. And uh, we want to do that, and we want to do a little bit uh, more sophisticated version of cohomology, which is hyper cohomology. That's when you take, you resolve each of these uh, shifts, um, say use, using Dolbo resolution, uh, and then you take hyper cohomology of the double complex. And um, you consider cohomology of that uh, double complex, and that's what we call Poisson cohomology. And the importance of this for cohomology theory is, the for, uh, and I'm going to explain it on the next slide, that second, co second cohomology, HP2, sorry, HPi2, is going to be precisely the first order deformations of this uh, problem, of this uh, structure, uh, X bar. So, okay, so this, as I said, to define Poisson cohomology, we need to take a global resolution of each, uh, shift here. Other res resolutions will, would work as well. Let's, let's take the both for simplicity. And so you take a uh, double complex and you will take a total uh, differential, so del bar plus g pi, and uh, take cohomology of that. And when you calculate cohomology of double complex, then we're interested in h pi 2. So that will have contributions with uh, from coming from three types of um, terms, so it will come, all the three terms might potentially con contribute to h pi 2. And let's see uh, what kind of terms are those. So the terms that comes from h0 of wedge 2 t, this is precisely global Poisson by vectors that you can kind of add to your existing by vector and potentially obtain different Poisson structure. Then this middle term is uh, H1 of T, of the tangent shift. So that's precisely the infinitesimal deformations of the complex structures of, of, on X. So X is complex manifold, so we can deform complex structure of it. And uh, Kodaira Spencer's theory tells us, this, tells us that this is precisely the first order deformation of that. And then there is the third term, which um, kind of a little bit harder to interpret. The third term would involve a two-form on manifold. And uh, that, uh, to explain that, uh, one needs to look at the uh, generalized complex geometry, a field called generalized complex geometry that's uh, worked out by uh, Walker and Hitchin. So I don't want to go into details what that means, but uh, I just want to say that naturally this uh, cohomology h pi 2 is precisely infinitesimal deformations of the pair x pi as generalized complex manifold. However, there are easy sufficient conditions when, when you check them. Uh, if, uh, if these two conditions hold, then h 2 pi is precisely what, um, what we were after, is precisely the infinitesimal deformations of the pair x pi as holomorphic Poisson manifold. So you don't have to worry about generalized complex manifolds if this uh, sufficient conditions are satisfied. Uh, so in our examples, they will always be satisfied, <coughs> but in general, they potentially might not be satisfied. But anyway, so I want you just to, to take from this slide that under some suitable sufficient conditions, the second Poisson cohomology is precisely the tangent the infinitesimal uh, deformations of, of the holomorphic Poisson structure. Okay, so that's that. That would describe the first order deformations, so infinitesimal deformations. And now, if you want to actually upgrade them to full deformations, you need to know a little bit more structure on the Poisson cohomology. You need to know this infinity structure. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail what that is, but um, basically when you um, consider this bracket on, on the cohomology complex, the scouting bracket, and you try to induce bracket on, on, the, on its cohomology with respect to the differential, so you obtain a nicely defined bracket there, but that bracket by itself is not quite enough to, uh, to describe full deformation uh, theory. So you need also to remember all these higher brackets that show up when you do homotopy transfer um, from, from this um, homology complex 
from, from polyvector complex uh, to its cohomology. And all these higher brackets now, they, they are very helpful because when you know all the higher brackets uh, of like higher RHE, uh, then you can actually solve the deformation problem by solving the maurer cartan equation of, of, for all of these brackets together. So you can write down an equation that uh, and solutions of this equation will be precisely the actual deformation of, deformations of the geometric problem, not just first order deformations. So that's, that's a little bit technical and abstract, uh, but that's very general scheme. Um, and uh, let me now try to describe, uh, I'll, I'll start describing how we solve this problem for, for, our, for one particular case. I want to, to describe how we find first order deformations and how, how, what, what, what uh, first order deformations actually lead to actual deformations. Uh, for one particular case, and that case will be when a um, log symplectic form we start with has polar divisor that has no normal crossings. So that's a standing assumption for, for today. That the form that we try to deform has normal crossing divisors. Okay, so and normal crossing means that it's generically smooth, and then whenever two smooth components meet. Uh, they need transversely, and whenever, like more than two, whenever let's say L com components of the divisor meet, they meet as transversely as possible. So in this way, <clears throat> they need like L hy hyperplanes in hy higher dimensional space. So that's what normal crossing is. And to to deal with normal crossing case, uh, I let me introduce the stratification of the divisor. So I'm going to denote by DL precisely the part of the divisor where L components meet transversely. So for instance, D1 would be just smooth part of the divisor. D2 would be the double intersections, the smooth part of the double intersection, which is the same as smooth part of the singular locus of the divisor and, and so on. Um, so each uh, DL is smooth, locally closed, with dimension L submanifold of X. So that's important stratification that I, I'm going to use throughout the talk. <coughs> and uh, to calculate Poisson cohomology for the normal crossing case, uh, we use uh, essentially we use uh, weight filtration called wave filtration. So typically the uh, classical case when people consider wave filtration would be in mixed host structures that was um, developed by Deling, but also uh, uh, recently Zebran used wave filtration uh, for the case of polyvectors, not, not forms. And, um, and we kind of um, more or less took it from him, uh, this notion, and we apply it for, for our case. Uh, so the weight filtration on polyvectors is defined as follows. So weight J piece of the filtration would be a polyvectors that are tangent, so each component of the polyvector has at most J at most j uh, vector parts that are not tangent to d, and the remaining ones have to be tangent to d. Uh, so for instance, if you consider zero weight part, the, those would be uh, polyvectors that are completely tangent. So uh, they, each, each component is tangent to the uh, divisor. When you consider weight one part that might involve one vector field that is not tangent to the divisors, but the remaining have to be tangent. And then finally, weight n, the last piece, weight n piece would be all polyvector field, fields. So polyvector fields that completely disregard the divisor. They just don't see it anyway. So that's an increasing filtration. And uh, why, why do we need it? Well, so um, filtration 
uh, is useful because you can uh, con consider associated graded of the filtration and um, differential uh, that is used for defining post homology preserves weight filtration, preserves associated graded. And um, so you can consider a cohomology of the uh, associated graded. And if you calculate that, then using some spectral sequence, you can calculate um, initial cohomology that you are, you are looking at. So we are, we are interested in this cohomology. So instead, we are calculating uh, cohomology of the associated graded of this filtration and trying to deduce uh, some, something about the actual cohomology. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the tools that we're using. And um, we, we actually are able to calculate all cohomology, not just the second one. But let me just present the answer that we obtained for the second Poisson cohomology using this weight filtration. <clears throat> so for the second Poisson cohomology, uh, we do calculation and uh, we obtain that um, all the graded pieces, uh, well, so a priori, uh, you can have only um, graded weight zero, weight one, and weight two part here. But weight one part turns out to be zero for all blocks and plastic structures with normal crossing. So weight one part just doesn't show up. And then moreover, uh, so you, you only have weight zero and weight two part. And moreover, the filtration on cohomology splits naturally. So you can... Um, uh, right, the cohomology is direct sum of weight zero cohomology and weight two part of the cohomology. So weight zero part of the cohomology would be those poly those two vectors that are tangent to the uh, to the divisor, and using the the symplectic form, we can invert them and make them um, you know just to um, to convert, we can convert two vectors to forms, and those would be logarithmic to forms. And uh, we can uh, consider the appropriate class in the gram cohomology of the complement of the divisor. So um, we 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 are able to prove that zero weighted piece of the second Poisson cohomology is precisely isomorphic to the Durham cohomology of the complement of the divisor. And then weight two piece of the cohomology is a little bit more uh, involved. So let me describe the weight two piece now. So weight two piece would come uh, from uh, some local systems that live on uh, the codimension two strata. So here, S runs over uh, condimension two parts of the divisor and that satisfies the condition that the restriction of pi is symplectic, so full range. And then each uh, condimension two part of the divisor carries a line bundle, which is just a determinant of the normal bundle, and it carries natural flat connection coming from the holomorphic flat connection coming from the uh, form omega, from log symplectic form omega. That flat connection might have and will have in most cases logarithmic poles over the uh, codimension three part of the strata. So it's not smooth on the closure of S, but it's perfectly nice holomorphic connection on S itself. And the way two part of the cohomology comes from global sections of this local system. So there are a bunch of, you know, codimension two uh, manifolds. They each have uh, local systems. And whenever that local system has flat section that extends to the closure of S, then you have contribution to the H pi two. <clears throat> so that the, the answer we obtain for the uh, H by two, and remember that H by two is important because it gives you uh, infinitesimal uh, deformations of the homomorphic Poisson manifold. Okay. <clears throat> so feel free to interrupt me if I need to clarify uh, what I said. 
So let me let me comment on um, on this flat connection here. So the flat connection itself is holomorphic object, and we kind of started with holomorphic object. We did use this connection that is completely holomorphic. But what's kind of very cool about it is that parallel transport defined by this uh, flat connection. So if you want to go from one fiber to another, that you don't really know have to know anything about holomorphic part of the structure. It's completely determined by the topology of omega. Omega, when you restrict it to the complement, it gives you some certain second ram cohomology class in the complement, and uh, just local calculation shows that parallel transport of, of this con connection on the line bundle completely determined by the cohomology class. So even though we started with a problem that is has very much is very much holomorphic in nature, we end up with um, some object here that controls first order deformations and that object is completely um, topological so we just need to look at the local system on on dimension two strata and determine whether it has section that extends to the closure of that stratum and that because of this common that for each strata we just need to solve some very easy topological problem Okay, <clears throat> so let me say a few words about how do you actually check that particular codimension two strata contributes to second Poisson cohomology. So you need to look at the, so first of all, if, it con if there is a global section, then it has to be unique up to a constant. So it only can contribute at most one dimensional uh, space to, the, to, to this, you know, to this H pi two. And then if it, if it does contribute, then the flat connection, first of all, has to have no monodromy on S. And moreover, so if it has no monodromy, then there would be global flat section of this uh, line bundle. But then you have to do some extra check to check uh, if that flat section is gonna extend to the to dimension three strata, if it's gonna extend to the closure of S in a holomorphic friendship. And, uh, and all these questions are actually, you can answer by just looking at the cohomology class of um, the log symplectic form and pairing it with certain um, second homology classes, so certain, certain two cycles. And when you pair, you just need to check where whether the result is integral or not. So you're gonna just have to write down a bunch of linear equations involving omega and check that they all satisfy. So this is some very simple, simple uh, procedure that you have to do for each of the strata. And uh, I'll I'll show example how it's done on examples how how these integrality conditions are checked in complete examples. I'll do a very concrete example at the end of the talk. <clears throat> but but the point is that it's very, very straightforward once you you know once you calculate the, the RAM cohomology and topology of all the strata. <clears throat> okay, so uh, based on, on this theorem that I stated, uh, which was like description of the first order deformation. So I want to, co to call a strata S smoothable if it contributes to the first order deformations. So the strata S is called, co-dimension two stratum S is called smoothable if the sum in, in the decomposition for H by two is non-zero. And the name smoothable comes from the following simple example. <clears throat> Consider uh, when consider a situation when manifold X is a C two just complex plane, and it has two uh, divisor which is uh, two parts of the divisor which are just two coordinate lines, and the you know log symplectic form and the bivector are of the following simple form. So the only codimension two stratum here is the origin. Divisor, then the only codimension two part of the strata is just this one point. 
so because it's just one point, um, it has no topology and um, basically all these conditions uh, uh, about flat connection, having no monogamy and so, that, and so on, they are vacuous here because it's just one point. So, uh, any, any connection over one point would have a flat section. And uh, you can describe the weight zero and weight two part of the Poisson cohomology very concretely. So weight zero part will be just, um, you know, uh, the unique generator uh, of the drum cohomology of the complement, which is one dimensional. So second drum cohomology of the complement is one dimensional and uh, the infinitesimal deformation in weight zero will just deform this class uh, of omega, that's second drum cohomology. And the way two part <coughs> will add this little summand, you know, epsilon times this bivector to the original bivector. And so what it will do to the divisor, it will, it will turn this cross into a little hyperbola, which is close to the original divisor. So it kind of will smooth out the divisor. And so it will kind of remove this double intersection here. And um, that's why, that, that's what kind of, that this baby example kind of suggested that we call all the double intersections uh, that contribute to first order deformation smoothable. Because the first order de deformation coming from this uh, double intersection is gonna do exactly this on a global level. It's gonna try to smooth out the whole double intersection. And uh, yeah, okay, so that, that suggests the name smoothable here. So that, that kind of finishes description of the first of the deformation for this case, or for the log symplectic uh, structures with uh, normal crossing divisor. Now let me uh, describe which of these first order deformations are uh, actually unobstructed. So which of these first order deformations, so there is weight zero part, there is weight two part, and uh, I want to now to describe uh, which of these deformations are, can be propagated to actual deformations of the structure. <clears throat> Any questions about uh, the first order deformations? Okay, so to describe which of the first order deformations are unobstructed, I need to introduce this a little bit technical notion uh, called uh, resonance. So a codimension two stratum, I'm going to call it resonant if the flat connection has a flat section on the stratum itself, but the section does not extend to the boundary, does not extend to the closure of the stratum. So, you know, if the stratum does not have flat section itself, it's going to be non-resonant. But only if it has section that does not extend over the boundary, in that case, I'm going to call such stratum resonant. And uh, so by analyzing L infinity structure and Poisson cohomology, we can deduce, we were able to deduce the following um, theorem. So um, let's, fix a compact uh, log symplectic manifold with normal crossing divisor. And uh, uh, let's assume that no codimension to a uh, stratum is resonant. Well, so first of all, you can say that uh, that's an easy part of the theorem. Maybe it was actually known before us, I think, that everything in weight zero is an abstracted. So whenever you have uh, uh, weight zero um, first of deformation, you can always propagated to actual deformation of the uh, log symplectic manifold. But then what's a little bit more surprising is that except each first deformation in grade in weight Z, two part is also unobstructed, meaning that whenever the codimension two stratum satisfies some linear equations that I alluded to, uh, you can always find an actual deformation of the Poisson structure of symplectic structure that um, actually 
smooths out this corner, at least generically. And moreover, whenever you have a bunch of corners, that bunch of codimension two strata that independently satisfy uh, smoothability conditions, smoothability equations, then you can find the joint, you can find the deformation that smooths them out all at once. That part is a little bit uh, unexpected. I would say that you know if you can smooth one, smooth out one corner, second corner, and third corner independently, then you can also find the deformation that does it all at once. <clears throat> so that this theorem kind of gives you a partial answer about which deformations are unobstructed. <clears throat> so it should be first order here. that kind of gives you description, partial answer to which first order deformations are unobstructed. So if they are of pure weight zero type or pure weight two type, then they are unobstructed. And actually we can push it a little bit further and describe which of the deformation in the direct sum are unobstructed. So we again assume this non-resonance condition Assume that it's a uh, normal crossing case. And let's, if, let's pick arbitrary first order deformation. So it's like this components in weight zero part and weight two part. And when we look at the first order deformation, we, uh, we would like to know whenever this first, we would like to know when this first order deformation can be uh, upgraded to actual deformation. And the answer is given by the following condition. So this first order deformation is unobstructed whenever this condition holds. So if the deformation of the, in the smoothable component S is non-zero, then the class omega plus uh, gamma prime has to satisfy the integral, integ integrality conditions that are imposed by smoothability of S. So in other words, whenever we try to smooth out one of the corners, we better ensure that uh, the deformation of the Duran class of omega coming from gamma prime still satisfies the integrality conditions. So omega itself satisfies the integrality conditions just by definition. What, what does it mean to be smoothable? But then omega plus gamma prime may already fail these conditions. So if that happens, then first order deformation will be obstructed. But if it doesn't happen, then it will be unobstructed all the time. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so I, I want to uh, now make a comment that this actually gives you uh, a lot. This gives you uh, Deformate, this gives you kind of local description of the moduli space of the holomorphic uh, Poisson structures in the neighborhood of a holomorphic Poisson structure that is normal cross, uh, normal crossing, block symplectic normal crossing. Because it kind of describes all the first deformation, first order deformation that are unobstructed. So it gives you gives a description of the modular space locally. And moreover, if you look at it, it gives you a completely topological description of that modular space. So this condition, as I, as I remarked, is completely topological. This integrality condition only depends on the drum class of omega. Reminiscent in this way of the classical Torem theorem that describes the modular space of Riemann surfaces as uh, in terms of periods of uh, logarithmic one, sorry, of uh, holomorphic one points on, on the Riemann surface. But classical, uh, classical Torelli theorem does it globally over the whole modular space. And here we just look at the small part of the modular space near, near a normal crossing structure. So that's somehow the, the main result. And now, uh, I mean, if, if I have time, I would like to consider sample examples where how, how we apply the theorem and uh, what kind of results we can deduce from it for, for one concrete example. <clears throat> Are there any questions up to this point? 
So my, my that, uh, just a question on, on this uh, condition. Is the condition the implication or is the condition just the gamma s not equal zero? Oh, sorry, yeah, the condition is the implication. So whenever a gamma s is not equal to zero, the, 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 this has to so be satisfied. The here, here, here gamma prime is, is just one specific element. Yeah. You're talking about first order deformation specified by gamma prime? Gamma prime and gamma s. And gamma, uh, so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Got, got it, got it. So, how, how, I mean, algebraically, can one check this condition? Huh? How practically? How do I check practically? Yeah. Yeah, so um, practically would be like whenever, so the, the, the first order deformation would be gamma prime, and then there will be some components, uh, you know, if there are two smoothable edges, then it will be gamma S1, gamma S2. So, I would have to look gamma S1, gamma F2, S2. If they are both non-zero, then I would be checking that uh, gamma prime satisfies smoothability condition coming from S1 and smoothability conditions coming from S2. So I'll, I'll actually explain uh, very concretely what kind of smoothability conditions you obtain in, in some examples on the, on the next slide. Okay. So far I agree this looks a little bit vague. What, what does this mean? But, uh, I want, it's a little cumbersome to write down in general, but for, for, for concrete examples, it's going to be very concrete expressions. Please, Mikola, you can discuss some example. You have still some time to do it. If you yeah, I still have time? Yeah, yeah, yes, of course, yes. Oh, okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, then I'll, I'll proceed to examples, unless there are questions about the theorem still. Oh, sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I think there is Kodaira Spencer map that classifies the formation of complex structure. Does it come up in your theory? Uh, uh, yeah. So that's actually a good question. Uh, so. Actually, yeah, it's a good question. I'm, I'm not, I'm not seeing it right away. So this first part is kind of uh, deformed the holomorphic uh, form, uh, the period of the holomorphic form on the, on the, on the complement. So this is just second run um, cohomology group on the, of the complement of D, and then we should be able to take this to form. and produce Kodaira Spencer map. And like my guess would be that this has to be done by applying the Poisson by vector to one of the components of uh, T star. So that would produce you something like T star uh, tensor product with T. And so when you take homology of this, this will give you uh, H one one. So that will, sorry, that would give you precisely the Kodair Spencer class. Um, but that's that's my guess. I didn't check it. I mean, maybe Brent uh, knows if that's correct. Yes. Yeah, I think it corresponds to a piece of the Hodge filtration on on H two X. Yeah. So that's a good question. I I, th I think. That's that's my guess, but uh, I'll think I'll try to think more about it. Um, and so yeah, uh, yeah. Basically, that's very very good question. Meaning, like when you deform the holomorphic Poisson manifold, you should be able to detect the formation of the holomorphic structure completely from this. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, so let me let me proceed to the example. So the example will be uh, deforming the logarithmic symplectic forms on projective uh, form space. And I'm going to assume that the logarithmic forms are toric, so they're going to be uh, preserving the, they're going to be res uh, respected by the action of the torus, the four-dimensional torus before. 
So um, they're going to be all of this form and then um, where b i j are some constants and I can arrange um, constants to be skew symmetric to form a skew symmetric matrix and I can arrange so, so that the uh, sum of the rows of each matrix is zero and uh, if the rank of this matrix is five by five matrix but if the rank is four then uh, you can check that it represents a log symplectic form meaning non-degenerate generically non-degenerate form on x and the polar, polar divisor is going to be just union of hyperplanes, five hyperplanes. And the scalars B, I, J, uh, they are quite important uh, and uh, we have a special name for them, uh, by residues. I like residues, but taking twice. Anyway, so they are by residues, they have geometric, they have topological interpretation. And you can detect this constants B, I, J by pairing, uh, by pairing the form on the complement with a small torus around the double intersection ij. So whenever you have one hyperplane intersecting another, then you can create a um, little torus around this intersection. So uh, taken like this and like this. And you know, uh, integrating form over the torus will give you a number and up to some universal constant, this is precisely B, bij. Uh, okay, so they, they completely, also it's true that they are completely the Bij uh, constant, they completely determine the form omega. And uh, they tell you a lot about the geometry of uh, log symplectic form. For instance, if you want to check if the double intersection um, is symplectic, meaning the restriction of the bivector has rank two, then it is very easy to check. It just amounts to saying that this constant is non-zero. Let me now describe the integrality condition that I was alluding to, but never actually wrote down carefully. But it's a little bit messy to write down in general, but for, for this case, it's very simple. So the smoothability of a double intersection, let's say one, two, amounts to the following. So you have to require that the, the stratum is symplectic, so B12 is non-zero. And for each uh, index i uh, from three to five, you have to come up with this fraction and ensure that this fraction is non-negative uh, non integer. So interpretation of this is as follows. Um, so co-dimension two stratum is always a two plane, objective two plane, and co-dimension three part is a um, union of three coordinate lines on this uh, two plane. And so what you want to check is that some sort of uh, whole flat connection on the complement of these three lines has no monodromy. That's the first thing. And uh, second thing you want to check is that the flat connection, flat section of that uh, flat connection extends over each of these three uh, lines. Okay, so to check that um, uh, you have no monodromy, then you have to require that each of these numbers is uh, integer. And in fact, if two of them are integer, the third one is forced to be integer. And to check that the section extends over each of these three lines that, that amounts to requiring that particular fraction is non-negative. That's what, what, what you obtain when you do calculation of smoothability in this, uh, for this case. Okay. And um, you can kind of check that the sum of the three numbers has to be equal to two. So if all of them are going to be non-negative uh, integer, then there are essentially two options up to permutation. It's either two ones and one zero, or one, two, and two zeros. So there are only two ways to satisfy this smoothability condition. And uh, the, the ways are as follows. We use diagrams to kind of uh, represent uh, smoothability pictorially. So if two of these numbers are one, then we draw this pentagram. And if one of the numbers is two and the remaining two are zero, then we draw this draw this pentagram. So what, what does this pentagram mean? So each of the 
vertices is, is a divisor. So you have five divisors, five components of the divisor. So we can put them in the vertices of a pentagon. Then we draw 10 edges, meaning 10 intersections. Each edge represents intersection between two hyperplanes. And then there is um, the, the, we, we, we draw one particular edge in bold, like this color, in color to represent that it's smoothable. And moreover, if it's smoothable, then we use either two lightly colored angles or one darkly colored angle to indicate which of these particular fractions are positive. So it's here, because we have two ones, so we do two lightly colored angles here to represent this particular numbers involving fifth vertex and third vertex uh, are non-zero. And here we draw one dark, darkly colored angle to indicate that a uh, fraction um, involving fourth vertex is non-zero. Okay. Um, so this way we can draw pictures to, to, to sort out all, possib all possibilities for uh, you know, combination of smoothable edges. So we draw pictures uh, called smoothable diagram. And smoothable diagram means that we have a bunch of smoothable edges, for instance, something like this. And each smoothable edge has certain angles which indicate certain equations and then we kind of impose all of these equations by, uh, given by all three smoothable edges. And if it happens that all the three equations, all, sorry, all these equations imposed by all the smoothable edges happen to have a solution which is, produces non-degenerate form, then we call such a diagram smoothable. So for instance, if you write down all the equations, I think there are going to be like nine equations here. And then in this particular case, there is a, there is a non-degenerate non skew-symmetric form that satisfies all the equations. You can check by hand. This particular one satisfies all the equations. And so our theorem implies that there is a way to take this particular bi-residue matrix and deform it to something that is no longer toric, deform the log-symplectic form to something that is no longer toric and where all these three corners are smoothed out generically. <clears throat> so you obtain some new Poisson structure this way. You start with something known, but this deformation gives you something. Okay. And then the last slide uh, basically tells, tells that we can actually run through computer and classify all these possibilities. It's a little bit cumbersome, but with the help of computer, we can do this and we can all draw all the smoothable diagrams that potentially that lead our theorem tells that this all such diagram, every such diagram leads to some new Poisson structure. And we are able to count how many Poisson how many families of Poisson structures we are able to get this way. And this gives you precisely, we can prove that this is precisely the number of families that have toric degenerations. So we essentially use computer here because doing it by hand is very cumbersome. So, you know, just by just drawing a bunch of these pentagon diagrams, we kind of extract new Poisson structure each time. And that's, yeah, I think that's kind of cool that the, all this abstract machinery at the end of the day amounts to something very concrete like this. Okay, sorry, I think I went over time. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there uh, questions or comments? I have uh, one question, perhaps. Um, so I'm wondering if in this theory there is any interesting feature of uh, the generalized scalar geometry, the same way that hyperkeller metrics are important to, to study model I have of hyperkeller manifolds. Yeah. Do you have any idea? Perhaps some sort of um, Kuranishi theory instead of uh, so, power so, series methods? Yeah. Well, so one, one thing that I kind of can see how this can be used is like when you start with log symplectic 
manifold, which does not satisfy these conditions. Uh, so if, if, if you start with something that where the, these conditions fail, then the, you can obtain deformations. So you start with lots of this Poisson, holomorphic Poisson structure, but you start deforming and what you obtain is generalized complex manifold, not, uh, not necessarily holomorphic Poisson manifold. So I, th I think this approach can be used to construct a new example of generalized complex manifolds if you, you know, by just starting with something very simple and trying to deform it using our theorem. But all these manifolds have also generalized scalar metrics on the line. So, so what, 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 what would happen with, with them? Even on P4, what, what would be the generalized scalar geometry associated with one of these deformations you, you described? Right, so for, for actually for P4, uh, this uh, conditions uh, are satisfied. So uh, whatever you obtain, each deformation is actually an honest holomorphic Poisson deformation. I guess you could consider it as generalized scalar manifold. Um, yes, yes, there is a result of Goto, yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can consider it as generalized scalar manifold. I, I don't think we know much about what kind of generalized metric uh, underlies it. We didn't really look at it. it. Certainly could be an interesting question. And I have a second specific question. When you say toric, uh, what do you mean by toric? You, you mean that uh, uh, the I mean, if you look at the Poisson vector and the action of the torus, uh, you mean that this Poisson vector is a is, is an eigen vector for the torus action, or yeah, yeah, just just that that it's preserved by the tor by the action of the torus. Toric just means that it's preserved by the action of the c star to the power of four on p four. It's preserved up to multiplication, or it's preserved. Uh... It's preserved on the nodes. Okay, and, and these deformations, uh, they are, uh, if you decompose them with respect to Eigen, with respect to character decomposition of the torus, how, how, what, what they are? So they, they will not have, yeah, they, they will not have uh, any, any specified weight. Oh, okay, <laughs> that was my question actually. Yeah, they don't have any specified weight. I mean, there are, there are this like, so some of these this 40 families that we kind of discovered by computer, some of them were actually known. And this like two of the most like uh, rich uh, pentag pentagrams on the left, they correspond to some known example uh, called fagin odesky Poisson structure. So Sklanin elliptic algebras, some people call them. So there you can actually describe what kind of weights are uh, showing up in this uh, eigenvalue decomposition. You can just mm -hmm. stay all the ways in the, there is very nice answer for that. But for this one, no, we are not sure yet. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Sorry, can I ask a question quickly? For sure, sure. Yeah, so I think uh, so I learned from Ginsburg that Kaledin he uses this Kadaira Spencer map to well for to study symplectic resolutions or something like this. So and symplectic resolutions are related to representation theory and things like this. So maybe your result also has some applications for symplectic resolutions or representation theory or something. Uh we are hoping so. I mean, one thing that is different from uh, in our setup from the setup of uh, Taladin, I think, is that he is very much interested in uh, singular manifolds. And we may very much, so far, we've been mostly working with smooth manifolds. So they are generically smooth. Sorry, they, they are just smooth everywhere, not just generically. Um, but but it definitely has some uh, connection to uh, representation theory because, for instance, uh, like the Spagin Odesky's Poisson structures, they came, they, they came from like this elliptic R matrices um, and they have relation to a lot of like representation theory. And so, uh, yeah, I would, I would assume that there is very nice connection and, um, because there are also another way to answer it is that there are a lot of uh, log symplectic manifolds arising from like um, 
uh, flag variety uh, or some slices and flag varieties and uh, it would be very very much interesting to study uh, or some deformations of those at some point mm -hmm. so i think it, there should be some nice relation uh, i just I'm not, I'm not yet sure what that is so it's a bit vague answer but i wish i could say something more <laughs> 